Legend tells of a band of noble warriors known as the Guardians of Gahul. Whenever trouble is at hand, seek them out. For they are sworn to protect the innocent and vanquish evil. Oh the yes. filmmakers of Legend of the Guardian. Hey, how's it going? How are you? Good. Blue team and the red team. More microphones. <laughs> it's just like being at a science fiction convention. Okay, so everybody's yes. plugged in and ready Hello. to go. I've never seen one like this. Not really. <laughs> So this is a six-hour press conference. How long is this going? Oh, we were told five and a half. Five and a half hours. <coughs> hours. That's great. That'd be fun. You can do that. Yeah, okay. Thank you all so much for being with us. And we're going to be uh, having microphones for everyone. And we're going to start with question number one. Hi. This uh, question is for Jim. It's a wonderful performance. And I'm wondering if you can talk about how you went about finding the balance in your character, um, through voicing your character. Uh, yeah, God, that's an interesting one. Because, I mean, um, when I first sort of found out that I got the part, I, I went onto my computer and I started to sort of practice with the voice. Um, and I just did it on a, on a program called GarageBand, which is on my, uh, on my laptop. And I started to just try out different sort of things and how the voice was going to work. Obviously trying to get an Australian accent was, you know, was the first sort of thing I had to try and get through. But, um, but I realized that I was, without, without um, the use of your eyes and your face, I thought, oh God, I'm going to really have to amp up my voice and really try and make it as kind of expressive as possible. So I kind of almost overdid it and was like over keen and was just like really kind of shooting high. And then I remember when we came for the first day to do, to do um, you know, a first session of putting it together. And I was, I was like, okay, I've got this character down. I'm going to really kind of over kind of play it, I guess. And forgetting that I guess that these incredible animators would put in the eyes and would put in the would would put in all these expressions. So so I really kind of overdid it at first and then had to sort of draw myself back and realise that, you know, there would be an acting performance and it would be created by, you know, these incredible animators that would, would do that job for me, really. So um so once I sort of understood that, I could just kind of, you know, play it as you would if you were sort of making a film, I suppose. You know, it wasn't a radio play, you know, it wasn't, you didn't just have to use your voice, that wasn't the only tool that you had, you know, these incredible animators would, would do, and you know, put in, and I, I'm, I saw the film last night for the first time and I couldn't believe the expressions they were able to put on these owls' faces, and you know, to put the comedy in there, just by a look, or, you know, the, the intensity in the eyes, it, you know, it just blew my mind, basically, yeah. Um, I'd like to ask Ryan and Jim too, uh, do you have brothers and is there a rivalry for your dad's attention? <laughs> or, uh, or sisters even, is there a rivalry for your dad? When you, or when you were younger, was there a rivalry or for his praise or attention? Or you go first, Jim, and I'll shoot you down. I just <laughs> <laughs> Oh, cheers. Thanks, Ryan. Um, um, I do. I have, I have an older brother and a younger sister. Yeah, so I am, I'm, the, I'm the middle child. And, uh, yeah, like Clud and Soren, I'm far more courageous than my <laughs> older brother. <laughs> I'm better looking and a better flyer. And, uh, no, I mean, me and my brother get on really, really well, so we don't have that kind of rivalry. But, I mean... What about Ryan? Uh, I am actually an older brother, um, and I too, like Clyde, suffer from what I have diagnosed as OSS, which is Older Sibling Syndrome, <laughs> where you feel the need to set an example, a fine example, uh, and you don't necessarily possess the, the natural gifts of your younger brothers, and I know I didn't, uh, and Clyde certainly doesn't. Um, where I think the older brothers too also suffer from the need to be amb like ambitious, overly ambitious. Uh, I try and use that for, for good. Clyde, on the other hand, was sort of easily persuaded to the more darker side. Hi, Zach. Is it a tricky balance uh, do between doing something uh, that would keep your fans of 300 and Watchmen happy and doing something that families and kids who might have no idea who you are and what other films you've done will like? Who are these kids? No. <laughs> um, 
You know, the truth is we didn't really, I didn't really, I, I honestly didn't think about it that way. Because, you know, the truth is we started working on the movie about three years ago. Like, before we started shooting Watchmen, we were kind of working on this movie. So it doesn't really fit in the chronology exactly. Like, okay, you know, you've made all these hardcore movies, so what are you going to do? Gone. Yeah. So, um, we really, honestly, I, I, I didn't really think about it like that I had any fans, so... I didn't really feel like I had anyone to like disappoint, um, but um, yeah. So I, I guess our approach was really just to try and you know love the story and and try and and, and make some awesome pictures that supported the story and and whatever language it chose, that was the language that it that it was told in. And I think that it wasn't a you know we didn't again like I didn't think about it in a sort of chronological filmography kind of a way. Not to disappoint them, to impress them. Well, just to, like, I, you know, I just wanted to make a movie that, you know, that is enjoyable, you know. Yeah. And I think that that, that just, you know, that can come any, at any time in the, in the, in sort of your sort of filmmaking life, you know. But Deborah, were you surprised, though, that he wanted to do a family film? I mean, after all these rumors that you won't do anything that isn't R-rated. <laughs> no, actually, um, this isn't R-rated. Zach, has, <laughs> Zach has six children, <laughs> and none of the kids were ever able to come to any of the premieres. They never saw 300. So they kept saying, when are you going to make something that we can see? And when this came about, we thought, listen, this is a great story, and not just for kids, but for the whole family. Because I know a lot of times we'd take the kids to see these animated films and we'd be like dreading it. And we said, you know what? We want something that like kids will like, but there's also something in it for parents. For Zach, can you talk a little about doing an animated film after doing all the live actions? It moves so much slower than that. I wonder if that ever frustrated you. And also working with the actors um, when you just have their voices to work with. You know, it's weird. Uh, I guess just to say, first of all, working with the actors is, you know, um, these guys have done an amazing job. And actually, the process of when you record just a, a voice, you know, in some ways it's a lot faster and a lot easier. Not, I won't say easier because, you know, the, it's all, you know, from their points of view, they still have to do all the work, you know, that they would do. But I think that, you know, because you don't have a camera and there's no crew around and really just a microphone and kind of a conversation, it's not as, um, it's, there, it's, it's a slightly different process in that way. I think that you can get at a lot more ideas kind of quicker. Um, and that part's kind of rewarding and fun. And it also gives us, when we were like putting um, the performance together for the uh, film itself, you know, the voice, you know, it, there's a lot of, it's interesting that there's, there, there, there would be, I, I felt like there was a, a little bit more sort of variety because you don't, you know, with a, a lot of time with an, you know, an on-camera performance, they might have, there's something about their look or um, that one take where maybe the words were not exactly as they were written or not exactly at the idea, but the, there was something in the performance that was so compelling, you're like, okay, I got, that's the take, it's gotta be that take, there's no other way around it. But um, it, it's interesting in, in an animated film, like how, just like building the pictures, you know, the, the words are, it's amazing how obsessive you get over like single words and single, like, you're actually listening to like every word, like, you know, the way you said the was odd, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you'd never, in a way you would never do with a, with a, with a live, with a, with a photograph performance because, you know, you just don't. Be there forever. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was exactly the same for us too, as well, because usually you're hindered by you know, maybe you're losing light, maybe there's there's a, you know you didn't grab your prop on the right line. There's all sorts of things that sort of hindered us as well. But then to be given that sort of freedom, well, you know what? Just try it again, 16 different ways, and let's see what happens. Let's see what pops. We yeah. did the videotape all the performances, and it's really fun to so look back. there's evidence of that, exactly. Um, because <laughs> yeah. they, the animators always had a visual reference of the tape, and it really helped them, and it's very funny now to see the animated character and then to see you know, our actors in the little video, because a lot of times like a head movement or something was really incorporated. Their movements became the character. Um, and that was a really interesting process for us to look at. I, I never want to see those tapes. 